Thank you. Good afternoon. Let me tell you a story. It's April 2012 and I've just been hit by a car riding home from work and I'm pissed off. I'm pissed off that every day I am subject to dangerous, violent driving, police threatening me with prison time for not wearing a helmet, and men in BMWs screaming, get off the road, bitch, simply because I choose to enjoy getting around on a bicycle. I'm also pissed off that The Age newspaper, where I've just got a contract, and The Herald Sun never cover what I see as a critical issue of our time, the ability of people to get around freely. Luckily, I remembered something that my favourite journalism lecturer told me. He said, the best thing for freelance journalists to do is find something that pisses you off and go and investigate it. So I quit my lucrative PR job, sorry. I bought a round the world ticket and I went to investigate. Why is it that more people don't get around by bicycle? And why is it that government faced with traffic congestion, obesity, air quality, rising petrol prices, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, don't promote it? Discovery number one was in Mozambique. In a, when the hotel manager threatened me with imprisonment in my own room, and then as I got my belongings to make an exit, punched me in the face saying, this is not Australia. I realised then that global bicycle journalism and solo woman filmmaking was not for the faint-hearted. More importantly, however, I discovered that the world is undergoing a global, excuse the pun, cycle that can only be perceived and therefore altered when you literally travel the globe, similar to a phenomenon that can only be seen when looking back at Earth from outer space. You could say I've gotten a satellite view of the world's bicycles. The global bicycle, the global cycle starts and ends with the bicycle. It's a cycle that probably started in Europe, but Africa is currently at the beginning. Phase one of the global cycle. People get around freely and easily by bicycle. Streets are safe, communities thrive, and economies work. These are just a couple of the bicycle shots from around the world. In Cuba, they also get around by horse and cart still. In Kisumu, Kenya, one of Kenya's largest cities, I found 25,000 bicycle taxi drivers that ferry school children, women carrying heavy loads to market and the elderly to health centres on their very affordable bicycle taxi service that is fast and safe. This man told me that he's put his eldest child, a girl, through high school on the earnings of his bicycle taxi. And though he was now getting old, he would keep working until he could pedal no further. It's a good job, he said. Stage two of the global bicycle cycle. Cars are allowed into cities, but no planning actually goes into integrating them with the bicycles and the pedestrians and the other forms of transport that already exist. The cars are given preference and the other forms of transport are pushed aside. This is most startling in Africa, where it's happening right before your eyes. This is Kasumu in Kenya, where there's a highway being built. It cuts right through a community and there is absolutely no provision for anything other than cars on that road. The results? is human life is endangered. And in fact, this, it's a little hard to see, but this spherical shatter pattern 
on a car windscreen is a very common sight in Africa. I assure you, it's the circular pattern of a human head. In Tanzania, I was actually surprised to uh, find that roads built with aid money in Africa are actually required to use 10% to non-motorised transport. However, it seems that no one in the UN is actually ensuring that this pathetic 10% is actually allocated to non-motorised transport. The first time a bicycle path was ever built on a brand new highway in Tanzania was when a bicycle advocacy group of about six people took up the fight. In South America, as you can see, it also happens in other countries. The road is built and everyone else gets to ride in the dust. In South America, I saw some of the worst examples of environmental destruction and poor planning caused by unchecked road building. It is a regular sight to see roads built on top of beaches in South American countries until the beach is simply washed away. This is not, however, thoughtlessness or a mistake. There is active sabotage and destabilisation of bicycling in cities. So in Tanzania, hundreds if not thousands of men earn their living by selling beautiful fresh fruit on the back of their bicycles. They are currently being banned from the city, which is of course their main income source, and yet Tanzania suffers $13 billion um, but 13 billion shillings, sorry, a day from losses in ec economic losses from traffic congestion. I didn't see a single bicycle in those traffic jams. I mean, in Malawi, I walked into 500 bicycle taxi workers had just had their bicycles confiscated by police for no apparent reason. One of the national ministers of Malawi who I interviewed said off camera, we don't have bicycle taxi workers. They're not registered, they don't exist. On camera, he agreed with me that the bicycle taxi workers of Malawi were a highly valuable and entrepreneurial service for his community. In Kenya, Kisumu, um, the 25,000 strong bicycle taxi workers are currently being cut out of the city centre. Politicians citing they hold up the traffic. I filmed the longest traffic jams I've ever seen in my life in, Kenya, in Nairobi, Kenya's capital. There was not a single bicycle holding up the traffic jam. This kind of car culture impacts life far beyond simply road space allocation. There seem to be a lot of money in Africa to build roads, and yet no money for basic things like water supply. This is just a few blocks from a brand new road in Dar es Salaam. It used to be a river. It's now an open, open sewerage pipe. And let me tell you something about malaria. It's carried by a specific kind of mosquito, a mosquito that only breeds in sewerage. And this beautiful, proud woman with her baby lives here. My guide told me that her baby is likely to die from malaria. What chance did he have? South America is further around the cycle. They got rid of their bicycle taxi workers in the centre of the city long ago. But a few hold on to dear life in the poor parts of Bogota. Just 30 minutes outside Bogota is a thriving and waterproof bicycle taxi service. Yet they continue to this day to fight for their right to exist. I caught on camera People coming home off the train, women with heavy bags, tired men, children, and they all had to walk home because the police were chasing away the line of bicycle taxi workers awaiting to take them home.
Despite being considered the uneducated poor of Colombia, the ecologically sound community service that they provide is not lost on them. Nor is the fact that they provide jobs. The, there's a growing number of bicycle taxi workers in Bogota that are single mothers. The diminishment of the bicycle as a viable transportation option in South America is powerful. In Buenos Aires, it has one of, if not the largest road in the world, a 24-lane highway cutting through the middle of the city, and yet only 15% of Buenos Aires drive. So the rest hang out of overcrowded trains, regularly getting killed. In La Paz, Bolivia, the air pollution from car exhaust was so bad, I was hospitalised after half a day of filming in the street. And in Mexico City, children live in apartments, not just beside highways, but with one below them, one outside their window, and one above their window. I simply can't imagine that what the constant roar and pollution of three layers of highway does to their growing bodies. And while not in South America, this is Tel Aviv, where there used to be a river, now there is a river of cars. Phase three, cities desperately try and bring the bicycle back. But without a clear vision and a plan, restoring the balance is haphazard and hazardous. One of the most popular measures are bicycle share schemes. Vienna's doing it, Tel Aviv's doing it, Belgium's doing it, Paris is doing it, Dublin's doing it, Barcelona's doing it, etc. However, they're the most uncomfortable bicycles I've ever ridden which is a fact that seemed odd when you consider we've been building bicycles for over 100 years. It was not so odd when I interviewed the man whose company had just won the contract to install the bicycle share system in Bogota. I've never ridden a bike in my life, he said. Other cities have tried to slow down traffic, which has been very effective but it doesn't alleviate the fact that there's limited space for bicycles. It doesn't alleviate Melbourne's taxi drivers parking in them. It doesn't alleviate buses parking in them or trucks. And so it is no surprise that then the people who wish to get around freely resort to high-tech safety equipment like high-vis and helmets, or militancy and protest. So difficult, in fact, is it to alter car culture, that it takes a natural disaster to shift the balance. This used to be a multi-level freeway in San Francisco, but it collapsed in a recent earthquake and is now one of their most popular tourist destinations. Surprisingly, no one wanted the highway rebuilt. The most important discovery that I found was that the people who suffer most from the active suppression of bicycle use are women. No more ride into town for her. She can walk the rest of the five kilometres or spend all her money on an expensive bus. It's no longer safe for women to have their children ride home from school. So now they work and they get their kids home. And the dead zones and the empty streets save for the speeding cars are the places where women are most vulnerable. Women are always the world's poorest. Even here in Australia, we earn 20% less than men. Thus, the ability to get around freely impacts women far more than it does men. So, what is the almost certain future of the world's cities? The obvious answer is complete collapse under the weight of traffic congestion, air pollution and environmental destruction. However, you might be surprised that I don't consider anything of what I've just told you a problem. There is only one thing 
that truly shapes our present and our future. It's our attitude, our attitude. I'm about to say something controversial. I request your forgiveness in advance. I am here to alter business as usual. It is the domination of the global bicycle conversation by the male sports cycling industry that is doing the world a disservice. The result of a male-dominated bicycle conversation has brought about by the collapse of men's cycle sports with the freedom machine of women is the total suppression of women's use of the bicycle, when in fact the bicycle is the transport choice of women and has been since its invention. A beautiful quote from 1896, to men the bicycle in the beginning was merely a new toy, another machine added to the long list of devices they knew in their work and play. To women it was the steed upon which they rode into a new world that still applies. In light of all that, we will continue to struggle to alter this global cycle by addressing car culture and poor planning or corrupt government or even the aggressive marketing of the men's cycle sports industry. The only place we need look is to the empowerment of women to once again enjoy the fun, the freedom, and the fashion of bicycles. Women are the key to bringing back the bicycle and returning livability to our cities, because it is women who actually choose the bicycle as their preferred mode of transport when it is safe to do so. Women choose it because we're naturally less aggressive, we have less income, we have to consider our children's health and their future, and we don't require a V8 engine to prove our worth or our sexual prowess. <laughs> there is only one way to get women on bicycles, and that's to stop the argument. The argument for the helmet or not for the helmet the argument for the separated bicycle lane or the not separated bicycle lane. In fact, there is no debate. And for God's sake, stop the incessant safety conversation. We simply won't ride, or most women simply won't ride if we're required to wear a helmet. I'd rather spend a night in a prison cell. And we simply won't ride if we don't feel if we don't have a separated bicycle lane and we have one tonne of steel coming at us. When you make it fun, free and fashionable, women will ride and we will bring the world with us. There is a huge number of bicycle fo women focused bicycle projects happening on the planet. So you could join and contribute to any number. I invite you to join me, to join me in continuing to gather and broadcast the stories of the world's one billion bicycles. There is, I've Googled it, one billion bicycles on the planet. And thus give voice to the men, women and children who rely on the bicycle for life. Because ultimately, as a Mozambican man with no legs, who uses a bicycle wheelchair said to me, the bicycle is not important. The bicycle is a life. <laughs>